welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, Associate Curator of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. This is Season 2, History Behind the Scenes, in which we explore the Rosenbach's remarkable historical collections, travel behind the scenes into the work of the institution to preserve its treasures, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day American civic life. We at the Rosenbach work every single day to preserve our historical collections for the benefit of the present and future generations, and this sometimes means collaborating with conservators who repair the physical condition of items in our collection that have deteriorated over time. It's a laborious and costly process, but one that, when done thoughtfully and in alignment with our organizational mission, leads to transformational results. Today, I'm sitting in the laboratory at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, just a few blocks away from the Rosenbach here in Philadelphia, to witness conservation work being undertaken on a remarkable volume documenting the diversity of religious culture in early America an English translation of the Koran, owned by members of the Jewish Gratz family. We'll talk with book conservator Richard Homer about the work of conservators to protect cultural heritage treasures and what steps you can take to preserve your own library collections at home. Some of the Rosenbach Museum and Library's most visible and striking artifacts of early American history hang in the parlor on the first floor of the historic mansion at 2010 Delancey Place. Portraits by the likes of Gilbert Stewart, Thomas Sully, and their circle depicting members of the Gratz family. An important Philadelphia Jewish merchant and philanthropic family established in Pennsylvania Colony by the Silesian immigrant Michael Gratz. Gratz, who was a patriot during the American Revolution, and his children attained wealth and standing in early Philadelphia, especially his daughter Rebecca, who became a prominent civic figure and philanthropist. Those of you who have listened to other episodes of the Rosenbach podcast may recall that in episode two, curator and senior director of collections Judith M. Gustin and I had a chat about the Gratz portraits and other artifacts on view in the parlor. While these portraits are highly visible on our house tours, it's important to realize that our collection of Gratz family materials is large and multimedia. The Rosenbach also holds Gratz family furniture, many handwritten documents created by family members, and rare books that once figured in various family members' personal libraries. Taken together, these items allow researchers and staff at the Rosenbach to explore fascinating stories about this individual family and the world in which they lived. It's a nationally significant collecting area that puts the Rosenbach on the map as a center for early American Jewish studies. Interestingly, many of these materials arrived at the Rosenbach after our founder's time. Indirectly related to the Gratz family, Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach, who was himself a leading figure in his generation's American Jewish community, established the core of our Gratz family holdings, but since that time, Rosenbach curators and librarians have worked with Gratz descendants to grow the collection. A relatively recent acquisition was a set of 18th and 19th century printed books that was gifted to the Rosenbach by a Gratz family member who also donated some of the family portraits in the parlor. While many of the volumes are in poor physical condition, probably having been exposed to less than ideal climate conditions over the years, they offer fascinating insights into the reading culture of the family over the generations. Though the books have not yet been processed and formally cataloged as part of the Rosenbach's library collection, one volume in particular caught my eye when I strolled past this shelf of materials a couple years ago. An English translation of the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam, published in London in 1734. The translation, by an English scholar named George Sales, is rather famous because Thomas Jefferson also owned a copy of the Sales translation, which was the standard English version of the book for many years. 
Upon investigating the book a bit more closely, I discovered that it also has fascinating provenance recorded on its title page. An elegant handwritten inscription reads, quote, Solomon Myers Cohen, his book, presented to him by his honored grandmother, Mrs. Judith Myers, 1760. This inscription means that the volume was owned by ancestors of the Gratz family in Pennsylvania in the mid-18th century. Solomon Myers Cohen went on to be a patriot soldier during the American Revolution. The extended Gratz family, and for that matter many other families in early Philadelphia and the surrounding region, were very cosmopolitan in their cultural outlook, and this Koran is a wonderful reminder that Jewish residents of the American colonies were aware of and interested in other religious traditions. In fact, Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic region broadly conceived brimmed with religious diversity in this period, making this book a wonderful tool in exploring that history. As I studied the volume, it also became clear that it was in a physical state that made it difficult, if not impossible, to use the book in our interpretive offerings, like Behind the Bookcase Hands-On Tours and other programs. So, working with our talent and development team at the Rosenbach, as well as our Young Friends group, we secured funding from the Sir John Templeton Foundation to send the book to the Conservator's Laboratory to be expertly conserved such that the book will be safe to handle, enjoy, and learn from once again. I'm so thrilled today to be at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia, where our book is currently undergoing conservation to learn more about this process. I'm joined by Richard Homer, who is Senior Book Conservator at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, often known as CCAHA for short. In this role, Richard meets with clients, assesses condition and treatment needs, documents findings and reports, and treats a wide variety of bound materials, from Incanabula to 20th century artists' books. Before joining the staff of CCAHA in 2000, Richard worked as Protective Enclosures Assistant at Harvard University's Widener Conservation Lab and as Collection Maintenance Assistant at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. He received his certificate in bookbinding from North Bennett Street School. Thanks so much for inviting me to the Conservation Center Laboratory for this conversation, Richard. Thank you, Alex, for arranging this chance to talk. I'm always glad to share about the conservation profession and uh, what it is that we actually do. Before we look at the Rosenbach book sitting here in front of us, I'd love to learn a bit more about what inspired you to become a conservator, and a conservator of books in particular. How did you end up in this field and at CCAHA? Well, my uh, introduction and interest in conservation came through an early love of books and uh, graphic arts related to books. Uh, I particularly enjoyed language and and art-related pursuits in high school, and uh, that gave me the option of being the editor of my uh, school's literary arts paper. So uh, I spent some time in publishing I tried my hand at bookbinding and uh, book book repair on my own, and eventually enrolled in a two-year bookbinding program at the North Bennett Street School in Boston. There, I, I spent a lot of time studying historical methods of bookbinding, and uh, I was introduced there to conservation and book repair in a more serious way. And by the end of school, I was pretty confident that I wanted to use my book-related skills uh, in the conservation field. The reason for that is that I had a vision of being employed in a in a profession that where I could I could sort of combine all of sort, all sorts of interests uh, at once. And um, in book conservation, you really do need to combine things like an awareness of historical and uh, literary textual content. You need to know material history and science. You need to be able to closely observe details and analyze those details. Uh, Sometimes it requires a bit of forensic judgment, understanding how things unfolded in history uh, from from details. And then uh, conservation treatment also requires some hand-eye coordination, which I always wanted to uh, get my hands on things and not just be a pointy head in in the pursuit of whatever I was going to do. Also, there's managerial and communication skills, like most jobs. 
where you need to talk to your colleagues, you need to talk to your clients. And in, in our case, we also need to be able to write uh, and document the treatment that we do. Tell us more about the work of CCAHA and what you do here, especially the diversity of projects you pursue and how your organization fits within the larger conservation landscape. Sure, we're, uh, we're definitely doing more than just book treatments. Uh, uh, CCAHA has actually been around since 1977 as a nonprofit, and um, yeah, we provide uh, conservation services, we provide digitization services, and also preservation services. So um, the materials that we will, we will conserve generally are books, photos, and documents, um, works of art on paper, uh, anything that's kind of constructed of paper or parchment, which is really animal skin, but it's, it's one of those things that behaves similarly to paper sometimes. And we have a team of conservators. They have a number of specialties. Uh, so we work together on different items, sometimes overlapping and sometimes not. You know, the items we conserve come from major museums, from libraries, from universities and corporations sometimes relatively small historical societies and private institutions, um, and also from private individuals. We also provide consultation services, conservators do, informal consultation, quick questions over, over email, and then for more planned uh, interaction with clients who have collections usually and have want, want a survey or an assessment of that collection to understand its condition and and uh, to make some priorities uh, with regard to treatment of that. Our digitization services overlap with a lot of places that, that provide digitization services, but we often integrate the digitization with actual conservation treatment. Sometimes uh, the conservation can get the object to a point where it's most easily digitized. And then um, it's certain objects really benefit from the oversight of conservators while they're being imaged and handled and digitized based on challenging formats or, or, or difficult condition issues. So that, that obviously provides access to a larger audience of researchers and other users. This is a, it's super important nowadays, now that we have the opportunity and technology uh, to, to make the most of that. And then preservation, uh, another Asian word, uh, is really the overarching stewardship of cultural materials. And that is something that we help people with through uh, community outreach, through education, workshops, webinars, conferences, and uh, people are able to learn and sort of hone their understanding of what they ought to be doing in their own institutions. So we have a whole staff, preservation staff, that they're often organizing these events or traveling for um, uh, consultation and assessments. And those assessments would be more in the areas of collection management, environmental control, housekeeping, pests, disaster preparedness, storage, and other, other types of things that are, are on the minds of, of people who have collections. What are some of the different reasons that individuals and organizations conserve books and other works on paper? Uh, conservation treatment is often time consuming and expensive, which uh, you, you noted, but there are many scenarios where institutions and individuals feel that the service is worth the commitment of resources. Universities and museums often have exhibition and research goals in mind for their materials. If a book is vulnerable to handling, but the research library wants it to be available for hands-on research or teaching opportunities, then conservation intervention becomes a priority. And that requires conservators to be very sensitive to the material evidence that makes the book valuable for research in the first place, which means that the conservation has to balance restoration of the physical stability with the preservation of certain evidences of use that may diminish its stability. The other things that can happen with institutions, uh, collecting institutions and individuals are not always where they would like to be in the way their collections are stored. Uh, perhaps their HVAC system is always letting them down or their roof has issues. 
or maybe the uh, collection has had a mold outbreak or has been through a fire or environmental disaster. Those issues are, are very difficult to manage without help and especially help with uh, from conservators and preservation experts and other other experts. So we do we do offer that kind of help help through uh, preservation mainly, but also through conservators. And many of the individuals we the individuals we serve, uh, uh, private individuals, are motivated by personal connections uh, to the items that they bring in for conservation. And you know they might be items that don't have high market or research value. Uh, but they are deep, deeply significant to the individuals and their families. And so we can see uh, very often items like family Bibles that have genealogical information. Uh, we see family photos and photo albums, scrapbooks, and a lot of ephemera that comes uh, from family uh, collections, if you can call them collections, right? They're things that they pulled out of the attic. Assemblages. Yes. Art. So that can be some of the most interesting material that we see sometimes. It's just sort of uh, random things that people have, have kept and things that most people would have thrown away. So um, that can be quite interesting. And we don't want to treat that uh, with, with contempt or with any like, less uh, understanding that it, it, is, it is a valuable item. Um, it has value. And there may be a monetary a limitation there, or but but it's still a priority to to preserve and conserve, and yeah, but we want to have that that attitude towards everything that we see. I've already said a few words at the beginning of the episode about the book in question and why we at the Rosenbach wanted it conserved in terms of our interpretation of the Gratz family. Can you tell me from your end how it works? for an individual or organization to approach you about taking on a project, the steps you take to assess what needs to be done, and how you go about executing the project. Yeah, um, and this is uh, sometimes the the thing that trips people up. They, they don't know how to start, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but for, for most things, a client will phone us or email us, and they'll ask for a conservator to discuss what they have. Maybe there's one item or several items, and maybe it's a serious conversation that they know they want it treated, or they, they just want, they want someone to hold their hand. And so we, we often ask them if they want an informal estimate, and uh, that usually can be determined from a few pictures, uh, not always. But I like to give an informal estimate just to give people an understanding of how much conservation treatment costs. And then if the client is still serious, they can, um, well, I know we scheduled a Zoom meeting, so it could be pictures or, a, you know, an online uh, meeting as well. But if they want to, to move further, they can schedule to bring the item here to drop it off. We can have a face-to-face -face discussion with, with the physical item there. And that can be a little more uh, helpful for, for me to understand what's going on. Or they can just drop it off. And then we eventually, we just get permission to write a report. And that report is really the beginning of the formal arrangement, uh, the formal uh, understanding of, of what the book is. And that starts with examination. So uh, I, I don't I don't write reports generally from photos. I need to, with a, especially with a uh, three-dimensional interactive object like a book, I need to understand how the component parts are functioning. And uh, you can't see that all from a, from a picture. So that report documents the condition of the book. Um, so we have something that says this is the way it was in, in case it does actually get treated. We also put... A proposal for treatment into that report, and that can be just one option, or it could be several options, like a, a, a very thorough option, or and a less thorough option, and less expensive option. <laughs> it, uh, it could often include a proposal for housing, which for books is usually a box or a wrapper or something like that, which is often very helpful. And uh, digitization is is a key component in the mind of the client. We can, we can digitize all or certain pages, say a family Bible, genealogical pages often get digitized. And then in the paper section, in the flat paper document, 
works on art of art on paper, they would be potentially considering museum quality framing or or storage mats or things like that to add on to their treatment proposals. So we do offer um, framing that museums use that uh, insulate the object from environmental conditions outside. So um, that's actually a, a particularly good good thing for um, flat paper items. So if the, the client gets that, they get a formal estimate, right, that they can write off on, they can sign off on and approve the treatment. We can't get started without a signature. We can't start messing around with, with things. And if we get that approval, then we can start, we start first with photos of the object. We have a report that describes the object, but the photos are obviously, <laughs> they, do, they do things the words don't do, and they, they work together to make sure that we know what the object looked like before the treatment starts. And then there's a real comparison because we take photos after the treatment is over. Um, and then the, uh, the treatment is assigned to one of the conservators and the treatment isn't usually conducted all at once, um, but it's, it's very much a hands-on process. It's not like we, we have a conservation machine. That <laughs> it's, uh, it's very time consuming, very sometimes use magnification. Sometimes there's a lot of fiddly things that need, need your fingers need to do. And, uh, a lot of repetitive things. Uh, treatments at the conservation center here are collegial. That doesn't mean that we always have several people working on a project, but we always make the most of the fact that we have colleagues in the in the lab. And uh, whenever whenever there's a slight question about something, or there's more than one possible technique to use, there um, I'll be climbing out of my chair and. Well, if it's in the book section, I'll just be talking to my neighbors. But uh, occasionally I'll wander over to the to the paper conservators or the photo conservators. And that's a that's a great thing to have that um, that resource. So, yeah, uh, I mentioned after treatment photography and then we do write another report after that. So there's 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 the high cost of treatment, but there's also an extra cost for what ethically conservators ought to do. That is to say document what is happening so that it can be interpreted uh, later on and there's nothing that's being hidden. So that's that's how things wrap up. That uh, digitization occurs. And then there's either someone has to pick the thing up or it has to be uh, delivered in some way. And we do have a registrar who packs things properly so that after all the work that we've done, something sad doesn't happen. Let's use this Gratz family Quran as a case study. I contacted you before we had funding in place to pay for the project to assess the condition of the book and what might need to be done to make it usable for our purposes. Describe to me, from that point onward, what you needed to do to examine the book, create a price estimate, and eventually see the project through to completion. Well, uh, Alex, after you had a good idea that the funding would be available uh, based on the informal estimate, you brought the book over, which was very convenient for you because you guys live, or are you? <laughs> you don't live at Rosendahl. We do. We <laughs> all. Yeah, you walked it over, which was very convenient. And um, you know, in a few days, I, I was able to sit down and start that examination. Look, o look over the Quran, and uh, took some time to handle the book, and that allowed me to interpret condition issues that I sort of saw in the Zoom meeting that we had, um, but they weren't entirely clear to me just how how well things were connected and, uh, and how th well things were working. So it took about two or three hours to do that examination and write up a report the report, like I said, it, it's the description of condition. That's a point by, by point description. It includes the cover. I generally start with the outside and work in the cover, the structure, which is the sewing of the book and how the linings keep the, keep the spine of the book together as it, as it opens. Uh, the leaves or the pages, how they are, how they are in terms of the paper, um, and tears and, and losses and things and also how they're attached to the book and the media, which generally in a printed book is not an issue, but sometimes there's manuscript issues. So 
uh, th those are the categories I tend to use to organize my descriptions. And then another step-by-step -step proposal, which uh, I don't know, there's like 20 or so steps. It's very detailed, as detailed as we can sort of make it at this stage, projecting what we expect we will have to do during the treatment. And that helps the client, especially if they're sensitive to these things, say, well, yeah, I'm not sure about that particular step. I don't think we need to do that. Or I'm worried about what might get lost if we did, did that. Or have you considered this uh, condition issue that I was worried about that you didn't address or things like that. So that's part of the proposal. The pro proposal and the estimate kind of go together. When you're signing off on the estimate, you're signing off on the on the proposal as well. Describe for our listeners what you discovered about this book and what treatment plan you developed. Where are you now in terms of doing work on the book? Well, this, this particular Quran is, is bound in what appears to be a, a standard 18th century full calf binding with you know, some gold tooling on the spine. It's got a red a leather title piece that says the Quran on it. Um, and uh, however, the front cover has been replaced and uh, it looks like the 20th century, uh, the t kinds of materials that are being used for that. So uh, it's a new new t kind of leather, kind of a weird leather, but it's been uh, sprinkled to kind of blend in, sort of. So that's, that's an interesting um, repair that's been made, and that's been attached to the book, that new cover, with two leather tabs uh, at the top and bottom of the, of the cover board that extend over the spine of the book at the top and bottom. And those, those are lifting away, they're cracked at the joint. In fact, the front cover is detached at this point. And um, so that's one thing. And then there's uh, the end sheets, the original end sheets, which would be rag paper, uh, are either missing or buried. And what, are, what is there is definitely a 20th century, a more modern paper that's been kind of stuck down as kind of as a board attachment uh, layer. Um, so that's that's the front and back, the, those new papers. And uh, one of the, the inscriptions, that you, the one that you mentioned, is, uh, no, I think it's another one actually, is on the fly, the new fly leaf. So there's, an, there's, there's actually material, provenantial material or, or information on the new material. Um, and so that just points to, okay, we're going to probably preserve these repairs, even though they aren't particularly finessed <laughs> repairs. That, so all of that just is great for interpretive uh, detail. And the, uh, the back cover is, is contemporary with the book and, it, and it's attached. So that's good. Um, the, the, there are several loose pages at the front, which didn't seem to be loose, but um, it didn't take much for them to pop off. And the, part of the issue there is along the spine edges of those pages, probably during the, the repair of the cover, someone just put adhesive in there and just stacked the pages one on top of each other. So that, that makes a stiffness there. And then when you try to turn the pages, it just makes makes it want to separate from the, from the text, uh, which it has. So that's, that definitely, that's the first thing really to address in the treatment. Um, so we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to detach some of those um, adhered pages, the ones that really want to detach. The, we will not try to force anything. And then reattach those leaves using sewing through the fold is a way of the, the standard traditional way of sewing a book so that the leaves open all the way um, and, and drape open really nicely. So that's the goal. And then we need to reattach the board, but we'll do it in a, in a subtle way, kind of a, uh, a discrete hinge mens that are underneath the leather layers. Um, and then all of those old mens will just come and re-adhere back down to where they were. And then we'll try to integrate those, those, those sort of awkward mens. We'll try to integrate them in such a way that they're not vulnerable. So it should, it should just look like what it is, an 18th century binding uh, repaired in the 20th century. All right. And, uh, but, but something that you can hold and, and you know, show again and again uh, in your presentations. Beyond this volume, what other kinds of projects have you done with the Rosenbach? 
And to what extent does having a close relationship with the client institution shape the final form projects take? I'm thinking, for example, that one of the things you know about the Rosenbach is that we use books like this Quran in a lot of hands-on programs, which might inform your conservation decisions. Yeah, um, I mean, I've been here at CCHA for 21 years, and all along there have been projects from the Rosenbach. Not always book projects, but um, very often they are they are book projects. I guess it's a, li- a library to some, some degree. So. Um, and uh, I just off the top of my head, I remember I worked on uh, a series of 18th century almanacs uh, in the early 2000s, including Poor Richard's almanacs. I don't think they're all of them that you guys have, but you do. You have a significant one. I think the 1753, the original. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty rare. If not, is that, is that the only copy? Yeah. yeah. So we actually worked on that. Um, no pressure. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, a journal, I think I remember, uh, a Philadelphia portrait miniaturist, um, is that wood, I believe is the surname on that, but, um, just a, just a whole diary during the civil war, um, and his personal family issues and the, the children that died in childbirth and, and in young age and big black lines drawn around when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he would just put like funereal marks on on the borders of the pages for that and for his his own children that was as i was working on it it's hard to ignore sometimes the content that you're working with we had uh the marion moore uh notebooks here just to crazy that those would be accessible um with her drawings of uh subjects in her poems uh lizards and things and uh uh, more recently, a 15th century Torah codex on, printed on parchment. Just a beautiful, a beautiful example of, uh, and rare of a book, um, from that period and, uh, rare for other reasons as well. And that was a, that was a rebind, which doesn't often happen, which, uh, in full leather. And then more recently, a 15th century bound manuscript of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which took Good long time. We had a good long, just kind of getting through that. Uh, a lot of challenges with that that treatment and uh, knowing what to do with it for researchers to allow them to uh, interact with it properly. So uh, yeah, no, there's nothing uninteresting that comes from <laughs> from your collections. Uh, um, see, but we've done yeah, we've done works on parchment. We've done prints and photos and documents. So, yeah, being familiar with your programming and, um, you know, just being in touch fairly often with the curatorial staff, uh, the communication, especially with the Torah and uh, the Chaucer projects that required more communication, um, helps just make the right decisions, uh, make, make it possible to fit the needs of the Rosenbach and, uh, and the needs of researchers as well, because it's... I mean, it's obviously bigger than just the collecting institution. The collecting institution usually understands their stewardship is not for their own institution, but beyond their own institution. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is we, we curators and, and conservators have their own specialties, and it would be wrong for us to pretend that we knew the details of each other's specialties. But there is an overlap of specialties there and a there's, there should be a striving, I think, for, for conservators to be up on their history, up on what what is it that I'm trying to preserve, actually, what information really matters. And um, curators should be obviously aware of, oh, do, maybe I shouldn't be putting this on exhibition or handling it uh, multiple times a year. Um, just an understanding of condition uh, issues. Do you work with clients who are individual people at CCAHA? And if so, how would any listeners who might want to consult about books in their collections in need of conservation reach out to you for expert guidance? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's simpler now than it used to be, right? We have a website, and that's uh, www.ccaha.org. And uh, there, there are ways of, in that website of navigating you know, getting getting uh, oriented to what we offer 
and getting uh, connected with the people that you want to get connected to, whether it's preservation people or conservation staff. But if you, if anyone wanted to talk, contact me personally, my email is rhomer, H-O-M-E-R, at C-C-A-H-A dot org. So I, I welcome any, any inquiries, any, no, no question is a stupid question. What general advice can you give to people who want to protect and care for their books, letters, and other family heirlooms on paper at home to keep them safe? Yeah, that's a very, I mean, it's a very common question that we hear. And, uh, I mean, one of the best solutions is to find a housing, and by housing, I mean a container uh, or a folder uh, that that protects whatever you have. And there, I mean, different uh, flat piece of paper obviously can go in a folder. Uh, a book can go in a box. And uh, I mean, people need to make good decisions about what is best for what type of item. But in general, there are vendors that sell good quality housing materials. They, the good housing is, is made with uh, either neutral or pH or slightly alkaline materials. And um, the idea is here, we're just trying to protect from dust, from light exposure that would cause things to fade from any uh, gentle impact if there's any uh, out of control activity in your house. And... Um, and, you know, uh, even even environmental changes, maybe you can't have the air conditioner on all the time or, or, you know, there's there's a there's a bit of a buffer there. If you have something in a folder or a box or, or something like that, yeah, you don't want to keep it in the basement if your basement is horrible or the attic if the attic is super hot. Um, so, yeah, the, you you want your temperature and humidity to be roughly comfortable for a human being. And uh, one thing, one of the best solutions is not to do something, and that is to try to repair the book or the paper on your own. Always, always, if it's valuable to you, and ask that question, is it valuable to anyone else too? <laughs> Maybe your aunt or your niece or your uncle thinks it's valuable and you don't. Don't, don't start putting tape, tape or um, whatever, you know, duct tape is not the answer for everything. And other more gentle forms of tape you aren't either and uh it just makes things worse yeah. for a conservator it's just i don't want to see tape on on my object so please don't do that and uh sometimes doing nothing is actually the best thing and a box doing nothing perfect i have one more question for you as I mentioned at the top of the program, this season of the podcast focuses on exploring how American history collections can and should inform our nation's civic life. Richard, what about the work you do here at CCAHA inspires you? And what do you wish the general public knew about the importance of preservation and conservation to our culture? Alex, I think um, it's really in the curator's hands how collections are culled and interpreted to, to form inform civic life and and that I can't I can't put myself in that place um, and so that's kind of a topic for discussion amongst curators and researchers and institutions collecting institutions but without the survival and the accessibility of primary source materials uh, you have textual materials, right? And you have material materials. You have uh, information that comes just from how something is made. Without all of that, we are just left to our imagination, uh, how to understand what happened and, and, and what people actually thought and felt, right? We're just, we're, we're just getting impressions and we're, we're kind of uh, creating our own history. And that's not good enough, I don't think. I think the primary source material and its and its availability, and uh, its survival, obviously, is is uh, it's very very valuable, and um, and it's true too that it, it, the more accessible it is, the the less it's it's given over to just one interpretation or one curatorial view. There's more of a democratic development of historical narrative. And so um, as things are put online and accessible, uh, there they stand as a public witness and anyone can go in and have access to that. Um, just as much as it's important to have a curated 
um, access as well. So you can, you kind of have the best of both worlds. You have the, the, the help of the curatorial uh, lens and you have the raw data that is there to kind of, to bear witness, right? And it's just so important that as a contemporary, in our contemporary culture, that we are not in a bubble and that we have access to the views and conditions of people that live before us outside of our context. And uh, I'm really, I really think that's, I'm doing it indirectly, but the, um, conservation is about the survival and accessibility of those materials. So. Thank you so much, Richard, for letting me visit you in your laboratory as you undertake work on this Rosenbach book. I've enjoyed learning more about the technical aspects of conservation and the role that your profession plays in the larger work of cultural heritage. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach Museum and Library's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, art, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and I always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach Museum and Library and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. If you cannot make a financial contribution, please give our podcast a good rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to help us build our audience. The theme music for Season 2 of the podcast is a setting of the poem Longings, written by poet, artist, and educator Nellie Rathbone Wright in 1927. Bright co-founded The Black Opals, a collective and literary journal showcasing young Black writers in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. The musical version featured here was performed by Yolanda Wisher, Paul Geis, V. Shane Frederick, Mark Anthony Palacio, and Sir Lance Gamble. I want to flee to a cool the Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about history on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. In the heart of me, drums in my ears, and my lips are wet with the tang of the sea.